Hi, my name is Alexa, and this is Queen of the Ring. I wanted to give a quick trigger warning for discussions of blood and violence. Throughout this episode, I'm going to be talking a lot about it, and there's some pretty harrowing parts. And if you're feeling a little bit squeamish or like you're not ready to hear something like that, I completely understand and listen to something sweeter (laughs) or not, whatever. But I just wanted to let you know straight off the bat that this is a little bit more intense than sometimes we get. Thank you. Imagine yourself walking through what seems like hundreds and hundreds of very green trees. All you see is this dense forestry and something in the distance. So you continue to walk towards it. And as you continue to walk in what feels like the middle of nowhere, amongst the dense Delaware forest, you see a wrestling ring with its white mat covered in red stained blood. I'm trying to take you through the first moments of a piece Vice has done on CZW, Combat Zone Wrestling. This ring is where one of the most upsetting and gruesome death matches took place, one that ended in somebody almost dying. And although I'm not gonna be talking about them much more, I just wanted to open with that visual of that ring in that green space. Usually as a wrestling fan, if I find myself in a conversation about it with a non-wrestling fan, I'll have to defend it. I'll hear the usual thing they have to say, which is that it's fake. And amongst a few spiels I have, when I'm feeling the ballsiest or the grossest, (laughs) I start talking about the blood. Because the blood adds an air of validation to the audience. Because when we, as spectators, hear that someone has bled their real blood, which just makes me think of that one dodgeball part where Ben Stiller's like, you don't make me bleed my own blood. Sorry. But when we, as spectators, see real blood coming out of a what seems like a performance, we're so captivated by it. It's, it, it shatters that line, I guess, between what is reality and what is this performance that we're trying to absorb. Like, I so vividly remember when Django Unchained came out and everyone was so fucking obsessed with that story about that scene at the table when Leonardo DiCaprio's character is screaming and slamming his hand down over and over again. And it's the story is told is that as Leo did one of those rough slams he broke a glass on the table and his hand started to bleed but he took that and he made it part of the scene everybody was just so moved by it they were like "Ooh, what an auteur and maybe there is something to suffering that people respond to maybe it's schadenfreude but i don't know i don't i don't know if it's enjoyment Maybe it really is just spectacle. But I do know that the blood reminds the viewer that there is real living flesh, bones, muscle, and excrement in that ring. Ew, that was gross. But they're real people. And this spectacle has come and gone thousands of times over thousands of years. It's almost gladiatorial. We like to see people fighting but maybe it's not that deep and maybe it doesn't fucking matter a piece i'll keep referring back to is an essay called popular entertainments and the spectacle of bleeding they quote the performer's willing and actual suffering as signified by blood is what constitutes the authentic in a performance that in so many other ways celebrates the unrealistic and the ludicrous In wrestling, bleeding tells a story, and for anyone who doesn't know about it, I'm going to try to structure a very, hopefully fucking brief, historical implication. 
because blood has remained a powerful storytelling device for wrestlers for almost 100 years. To use fake blood isn't even considered. If someone bleeds in a ring, it is their real blood. So retrieving your own blood can happen in a few different ways. Maybe you get busted open with a wicked blow or a table or chair, something. Back in the 50s, if guys wanted to pull out the crimson mask from their toolbox, they would sometimes use a fork before the match to soften up the skin on their forehead as to easier be able to be busted open by a fist to the brow or something, which is so gross. It's like tenderizing meat. Ugh. But sometimes, and usually, it happens from blading, which is exactly what you think it is. If you've seen the movie The Wrestler, you watch Mickey Rourke do it in the opening scene. And it can happen a bunch of different ways, but one is maybe there's tape wrapped around a wrestler's wrist, and after their opponent hits him over the head with a chair, they fall back out of view of the audience, removing a piece of razor blade that was taped inside on their wrist. Next, they cut their forehead, softly but high up, and then maybe throw the razor to the side or hand it to the ref where they throw it out of the way. Next, the sweat takes hold and the blood starts to trickle down their face, slowly forming a blood-stained mask, blurring their features, making them look like everyone else who's ever bled in the ring. Since it's a storytelling device, it has to be at the right moment, right time. From the spectacle of bleeding. Once one is shown blood early in a play, one has to keep it up throughout the production and even escalate its use. If one uses blood in the Act 1 brawl scene of Romeo and Juliet and continues to use it in the Act 3 scenes for Mercutio and Tybalt, then by the time of Paris's death and Juliet's suicide, the use of blood may have lost its impact. And that impact is incredibly powerful in film and wrestling. I don't know if there's really any validity to this statement. It's really just a passing thought in my head, but these types of matches kind of make me think of those exploitation films that were so popular in the 70s and 80s and are still made today in a way. They're both looked at as, I don't like this term, but I can't think of another way, low brow and maybe trashy in a different way. And maybe wrestling is kind of like that in general. Either way, blood in the right moment can make a wrestler a star, a legend. There is one specific match that is the measuring stick for all other bloody matches and is extremely well known amongst wrestling fans as the bloodiest match in history, or at least, you know, debatably the bloodiest match in history. In the book Way of the Blade by Phil Schneider, he discusses some of the bloodiest wrestling matches, and he discusses this scale and this match that created it. The great Muda and Hiroshi Hayes had a match on December 14th, 1992, on New Japan Wrestling. The match started off slowly, but quickly actually escalated as Muda began throwing chairs and tools from underneath the ring. Hayes grabs a wrench, one of many being tossed into the ring. And when Muda rolled back in, Hayes immediately started carving at his skull with this wrench in his hand. To quote Way of the Blade, Hayes, what is normally a slightly colorless amateur wrestler, embraced his inner ghoul here. He chewed and sucked on Muda's pulsating wound, spraying and dribbling out of his mouth like Nosferatu. This became the standard as by the end everybody was covered in blood, both of the wrestlers themselves and the referee, by fact of just standing near them. And since then, of course, some people have felt there are matches that have broke the Muda scale. One being a very memorable blood-puddled mat. In 2004, the WWE held a match between Eddie Guerrero and JBL. After much too deep of a blade job that Eddie did on himself, it quickly became a laceration on his forehead. The blood pours out so dramatically within seconds, he looks like he needs severe medical attention. And he keeps going and they put on an incredible match, and Eddie went into shock following. 
And that's fucking terrifying. I'm not a fan of the extremely hurt yourself to put on a good show mentality. Like, that doesn't make me personally happy. Like, the whole Kurt Angle breaking his neck in a match and then keeping going throughout the whole thing. Like, we should never expect that of somebody and he shouldn't be expected to perform like that. It it doesn't make him greater. It, It just makes us sad, doesn't it? And of course, I can't discuss any motivations for doing any of these incredibly dangerous things to yourself without mentioning the compensation, which is money. Something promoters would say to their wrestlers is red means green. The bigger the spectacle, the higher the pay. And because the wrestler's own body is their commodity, they kind of have to keep pushing the limits. Almost in a way kind of reminds me of the porn star that was very famous in the early 90s, Savannah. After leaving porn for a short amount of time, when she came back to do another movie, she promised her fans that she was going to do anal for the first time, which people were super stoked about. And viewers were stoked because it was novelty and the spectacle was growing as her limits were being pushed further and further as so many wrestlers have as time has gone on. And that can kind of be said for a lot of people whose body is their work, you know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people who use their body as their way to make money. And I don't say that comparison to sound like I'm trying to be shocking or salacious or something. I'm just, I just think that there's kind of a comparison there and I like to explore it in a way. Um, And I'm not saying anything specific about what sex work is or what sex work isn't. I'm just making an observation. But back to the bloody matches. We were talking about money. One way people were digesting their wrestling information was through wrestling magazines at this time. And there was this really symbiotic relationship between bloody matches and the magazines in the 60s into the 80s, kind of. There were so many magazine covers featuring a blood-soaked Terry Funk, Ric Flair, or Eddie Guerrero, or way more. And as time tends to do, it went on and people's lives went on and many of these same men that were featured in these magazines, who if they're still alive, they bear the scars of these slices and cuts and shit. Whether they're with us now or not, these are some of the people that did. Dusty Rhodes, New Jack, Bruiser Brody, all of Mick Foley's personas. Tarzan Goto, Balls Mahoney, Abdullah the Butcher, Sabu, and Manny Fernandez, just to name a few. Mick Foley even said that the scars on Abdullah's forehead were so deep that he would be able to hold coins or gambling chips in them as a freaky party trick. But Abdullah would also cut people without their consent in the ring, which is really incredibly fucked up. Like, it's usually the performer's choice to do this type of thing. It's all type of consensual. And, of course, unless it's accidental in the ring, you know, but... He would just stab people with pencils, fucking weird-ass razors, and he gave Devin Nicholson a blade without his consent in the ring, and he got hepatitis C from it. And years later, he sued him and received a $2.5 million settlement doing it. So there's a real danger to this. And I know throughout this whole time, we've only talked about the men of it all. But women did it too. And women involving themselves in death matches and the bloody side of this sport is very alluring for spectators. I guess people don't expect women to partake in something so debased. But it's incredibly understandable why women would be tempted to do bloody matches. Gives them more money. You know, I already said red means green. And... The spectacle increases as women begin to participate. But it's just, it's not just economic and monetary advancement, of course. It's also a career shifter. 
It would allow them to transcend and reach this same status that men were receiving at the time. When men came out of these bloody matches, they quickly became almost mythical. And maybe it feels right to watch women do these types of matches because they're throwing femininity on the floor. They bleed all over it. I don't know. They're doing the same thing that the men are doing. And blood has allowed women's careers to transcend time. I'm going to try to mention a few, which I could talk about a lot, but I'm going to try to keep it shorter. My first mention is previous queen of our ring, Megumi Kudo. She became the queen of extreme in the early 90s in a promotion called Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling, FMW. She, along with her comrades that trained with her at All Japan Women, AJW, in the 1980s, such as Aja Kong, Manami Toyota, and more, changed the landscape for women's wrestling. These women began inserting themselves in roles that had only been occupied by men wrestlers at the time, and fans responded incredibly well. FMW was started by Atsushi Onita, who was a pioneer of deathmatch wrestling, and he took inspiration from that of Terry Funk, who repeatedly graced the covers of many a magazine that was featuring a bloody, soaked Terry. So Atsushi decided to start his own promotion in Japan, and he quickly noted the brutality that the women he was hiring were putting each other through and the popularity of it. Because these women wrestled hard style, just like the men. They were hitting each other. They were folding each other in half. And they realized that starting these hardcore matches were really bringing in crowds. And I know I say this almost every fucking one of these episodes, so if you heard them all, I'm very sorry. But I think it's just, I really encourage people to go look up FMW on YouTube or something. There's really a lot of incredibly preserved footage of these amazing matches. But to jump forward a long-ass time, over 20 years, there's some really great matches in between, of course, just for the sake of your time and my time. I, but I want to mention something that happened to the man, Becky Lynch. Becky Lynch is a WWE superstar who has gotten some amazing success in the last few years that has been unrivaled by women before her. But at first, in her career in WWE, she was finding it really hard to get her footing with the fans. She describes feeling left out of the four, the four horsewomen of the WWE because she didn't feel as cherished as Charlotte, Sasha, or Bailey. On a night leading up to Survivor Series in November of 2018, the whole women's roster finds their way out to the ring, Raw and SmackDown, and everyone is just going at each other. A formidable opponent in Nia Jax, cousin of The Rock and the Usos, approaches Becky, and in any footage of the match that you see, you don't see her punch her dead square in her nose, but some fans there caught the footage from the strike on their phones, and you can see it on YouTube. But emerging from the ground is a blood-streaked face of Becky Lynch and a genuine-ass broken nose. As she stands there with her arm up, walking into the audience, looking to the camera with her bloodied head held high until she is in one of the tunnels of the stadium and fans are screaming all around her, Becky became her persona, the man. Her stoic, blood-soaked face gave her an edge that took her into superstardom. Even the following the break, Nia sent Becky flowers apologizing for what she had done, and in response, Becky says back that she really should have been the one to send Nia flowers because it changed her fucking career. It became an iconic image. I not only have a fucking t-shirt with it on it, but I also have a pin. To continue on to another story of success by blood, Dr. Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa just a little less than a year ago at the new AEW, there was a match that completely shifted the career of one of its combatants, and I would actually argue both. 
Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa start their spat with a no DQ match, which always perks my ears up as not many women are given that opportunity still. But after the match starts, it seems they both did a soft blading to their own foreheads with lightly smeared blood on their brow. And Thunder Rosa sits Britt Baker up in the corner of the ring, placing a ladder on the bottom rope, trapping Britt in this slumped position on the ground. Gathering her momentum, Thunder Rosa runs to the other corner, runs back and drop kicks the ladder directly into Britt's forehead. After only one moment of shock, the blood begins to pour down Britt's face. Her friend outside the ring gives her her sleeve to wipe off the blood that is pouring into Britt's eyes, clearly obscuring her vision. It looks like the match is gonna be over, but these women keep on fucking going. Britt brings out a bag of thumbtacks, gets driven into them by Rosa, and the match finishes... In spectacular execution, with Thunder Rosa driving Britt through a table on the outside of the ring, giving her the win. And although Thunder Rosa was already incredibly popular before this, she became even more mythical for defeating Britt in this way. And this made Britt a star. She was already well known at AEW, but... Her star rose so high after this moment. She started selling shirts with her bloodied face directly on the front, and the audience hasn't betrayed her since. AEW also had another vicious no-DQ match between Penelope Ford, The Bunny, Ty Conti, and Anna Jay. If you're very bloodthirsty, you could look it up. As I come to the end of this episode, I wonder... Why wrestling has kept blood as their storytelling weapon. And if it matters to really think about it, I guess. Because I think there is something to just liking something for its stupidity, you know? And it doesn't have to be explained, even though I like to explain things. I like to think about things in a way that adds the density to them. But sometimes things don't need density. But I don't know. Femme people in these roles are kind of fascinating in a gender way. Women subverting expectations is a given in wrestling. And I guess the bloody parts of it remind us that they are just as scary and freaky and weird and stupid as the men. (laughs) But they're also as beautiful and better, probably. But then I guess that's fucking it. I don't know. I quickly wanted to add, shortly after I put this episode out, I will be releasing a follow-up episode of an interview with the author of a book I mentioned throughout this one. Phil Schneider, the author of Way of the Blade, sat down with me to discuss some bloody women's matches and bloody wrestling in general, and wrestling in general. And if you're interested, give it a listen. And if you made it this far, I want to say thank you so much. Queen of the Ring was written by me, Alexa Pruitt. The music is by Kreider Dane of Helter Skelter Music Productions. If you like what you hear, join us again. Thank you. (laughs) 